Anybody know what today is? <laughs> Sunday. For the last uh, three weeks, we've been using this little pamphlet called The Christmas Story to base our messages on, and we've looked already at the advent of hope and the advent of peace and the advent of joy today. We'll look at the advent of love. You may have heard the slogan, Jesus is the reason for the season. And that's exactly what I want to present this morning. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 2. To the well-known story of the birth of Jesus, the Christ. I'll begin reading on the first verse, and reading down to verse 14. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. In order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child, While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. The advent means the coming of Jesus, the Christ, or Jesus, the Messiah. We're going to be looking at this advent of love. Christmas is all about God became man. We call that the incarnation. God became man for a most wonderful purpose. That purpose is to save us. And the purpose is rooted in his attribute of love, God's attribute of love. I have this little devotional by Billy Graham. Now, he's with the Lord, but it first came out and was titled Christmas, the Father's Gift. And he writes on page 36... Sometimes in the rush of Christmas activity, we forget the most wonderful part of the Christmas. It is the fact that the person of Jesus Christ, God became flesh in order to save us from our sins. This is the crux and the core of the Christian message. The prophets wrote of it, the psalmists sang of it, the apostles rejoiced and built their hopes on it, and the epistles are filled with it. Christ coming in the flesh. His invading the world, his identifying himself with sinful men and women is the most significant fact of history. What an incredible truth. Think of it. The God of the universe came down from heaven that first Christmas night and took human form. If you want to know what God is like, then take a long look at Jesus Christ because he was God in the flesh. God in the flesh. The purpose for Jesus coming, as it's said in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, for you there has been born a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. When I think of this idea of Savior, 
I come to one verse, a well-known verse. In fact, it was Billy Graham's favorite verse. It's John 3.16. And the greatness of the Christmas story can be summed up in that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Great verse. Before we look at it, would you join me in prayer? Lord, we come before you. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you that over 2,000 years ago, Father God, you sent your Son into the world. God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And now, Lord, I ask that you would show us this verse, John 3, 16, and how it applies to us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at the greatness of each part of this verse. Let's start off with the word for God. For God. He's the greatest being. The prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 45 in verse 21, Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. The greatest being for God, it starts the verse, but it goes on to say, for God so loved this is the greatest of all emotions, the greatest emotion. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love. 1 John 4, 8, it tells us the greatest emotion is love because God is love. Yet love is more than just an emotion. It becomes an action. It's something that can be demonstrated. And Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Love was demonstrated in the fact that God had his son placed on a cross for you and for me. For God so loved. What did he love? He loved the world. This is the greatest assembly the greatest assembly of people who have a need. Why do we have a need? 1 John 5, 19 says, we know that we are of God. He's writing to the believer, John is, and he says, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Normally, we don't think about that. We don't think that the whole world all around us, all people are under the domain of darkness, under the power of the evil one. But that's exactly what this verse is saying. And to make matters worse about this world, it tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, you, when you were born into this world, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He goes on to say, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. You were just like everybody else, dead in your trespasses and sins. And you walked according to the prince and the power of the air. That is the evil one of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. For God so loved the world, a world that was made by him, but the people, every person ever since Adam and Eve sinned, that world is fallen. People are fallen. We are sinners by nature. But God loves you as a sinner. For God so loved the world that he gave. This is the greatest act in history. God gave. What did he gave, give? He gave his son. He sent his son into this world. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And you look at that word propitiation, you go, what in the world is that? So the new NIV and other translations made it 
propitiation, the atoning sacrifice. What it's saying is God sent his son into the world for the purpose of going to a cross, that on the cross he took upon himself my sin and your sin. He was the sacrifice by which God could look at us and then give atonement or give forgiveness to us who are sinners. Each one of us sins, and God gave the greatest act. John 3.17 says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God sent his Son. What an act. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. This is the greatest gift. The greatest gift. Only begotten does not mean Jesus was created or Jesus was born. It's a word in Greek that means uh, one begot, meaning he's unique, he's one of a kind. It's actually used of Isaac in Hebrews eleven seventeen that he's the only begotten. But only begotten means that Jesus was born of Mary, but really was the Son of God. In Luke chapter 1, verses 34 and 35, the angel Gabriel talked to Mary, and Mary answers when she finds out she's going to bear a child, even though she's a virgin, and Mary says that to the angel in verse 34, how can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. God's Son, the greatest gift, was given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever, this is the greatest opportunity for the world, whoever, whoever, Romans 10, 13, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And in that context, calling on the Lord is to call on him for salvation. Whoever. This great opportunity comes down to a simple choice for every person. John 3, 18 says, he who believes in him, that means believes in Jesus, is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The name of the only begotten Son of God is Jesus. His name means Savior, Deliverer. Opportunity, simple choice. You either believe or you don't believe. Simple choice. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him. This is the greatest simplicity. To believe. To put your faith in, put your trust in Jesus. In fact, John 20, 31, the reason why John wrote the gospel, it says, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Belief. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, it's for by grace you have been saved through faith. Saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Faith, belief, trust, not working for salvation, simply believing in Jesus as Savior and Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. This is the greatest promise. Shall not perish. When Jesus raised, was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he was speaking to Lazarus' sister, Martha. And in John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus is speaking, and he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then Jesus asked her, do you believe this? What Jesus is saying, there is life after death. Life after death, what a promise. And those who put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ will never perish, will never die for eternity. But those who do not trust in Jesus Christ, their death is an eternal death. It's forever separation from God. 
The greatest promise comes down to belief. There's life in Jesus after death. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This past Tuesday, a dear lady at Medina, Bonnie Loofborough, a member of this church, was present with the Lord. Absent from the body, she was present with the Lord. Isn't that a great promise? Not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen is right. Believes in him shall not perish. The next two words, but have. This is the greatest certainty, but have. But have. 1 John 5, 12 says, He who has the Son, he who has Jesus, has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. It's have or not have. If you have the Son, you have life. If you do not have the Son of God, you do not have life. And the very next verse says in John, 1 John 5, 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know. This is a certainty. Belief. You have eternal life. And that's how the verse ends with eternal life. The greatest possession Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. We're all sinners by nature, and the wages of sin is death is separation from God forever. The verse goes on to say, but the free gift of God is eternal life, but it's only in Messiah or Christ Jesus, our Lord. The greatness of the Christmas story, why Jesus became man, why the Son of God became man, is summed up in that verse. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. What strikes me most about the Christmas story is how much love God has for you. How much love God has for me. How much love God has for the world. It's out of love that he sent his son, into the world. Jesus came for a purpose. That purpose was to die on a cross to pay the penalty for my sin, the penalty for your sin, the penalty for the whole world's sin. He died. He opened the way for us to have eternal life, the forgiveness of sins through his shed blood on the cross. It's a gift. It's a free gift, the verse told us. It's offered to you. It's offered to the whole world. Jesus showed us the marvelous truth that God has offered the world a gift. It's the gift of life. It's a gift of life in the person of Jesus, God's own son. But you know... This gift, free gift, is often rejected. Tomorrow, all three of my sons, well, actually not just my sons, Cheryl's sons too, our sons, <laughs> will be coming to our home for a celebration of Christmas. Three boys, 12 grandchildren, Praise the Lord, we have more than one bathroom. <laughs> and we're going to get together in the afternoon, and we're going to read the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2, talking about how God sent the Savior into the world, who is Christ the Lord. And then after we read that, we'll open presents. And if tradition holds up, each one of our 12 grandchildren will receive the gift that's offered them in love, and they will open that gift. So far, in the past, we have not had one grandchild hand a gift back saying, I don't want it. That has not happened yet. Every gift offered has been opened. 
God's offered you a gift. It's the gift of his son, Jesus. And many of you have heard this salvation story that God has offered you a gift and you still haven't received it. Maybe you don't think you're good enough to receive that gift. I want you to watch this little video. It's a song video called, Oh Come All You Unfaithful. Christ is born for you. Christ, Christos in the Greek means anointed one, Messiah. 
It means the king. The king was born for you. In John chapter 1, it says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them, God gave the right to be called children of God to those who believe on his name. It's all about believing on Jesus. And when I talk about believing on Jesus, I don't mean believing with your head, recognizing that Jesus lived a life of perfection, that he went to the cross, he died on the cross, he was buried in the ground, and he rose again from the dead. That is all true. But you know, even the demonic has seen that and know that. It's not just about what you believe in your head. Belief means more than just an intellectual belief. It's also a belief of your emotions. It's an emotional belief. It's a recognition that I deserve to die. And yet Jesus, he loved me so much that he gave his life. He died on the cross to pay for my sin. And I'm welled up with love for the one who loved me. It's about my emotion too. But most importantly, it's about my will. My intellect, my emotion, and my will. My will means I choose him to follow him now as my Savior and Lord. I no longer belong to myself. I now belong to Jesus. It's a free gift. But you have to believe. You have to put your faith, put your trust in Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And he gives you forgiveness of sins. He adopts you into God's family, and he will eventually give you eternal life. As I said, that's called the gospel. And many have heard it. And still reject it. I give you the invitation to believe, to receive. Come. All you unfaithful, come. All you who are broken, come. For those who believe in the Son of God, there is peace as the song went on to say, will you receive this gift? Please bow your heads in prayer at this time. Christmas is about Jesus, the Christ, coming into this world for the purpose of going to a cross to save people. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world or condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. Might be saved. Will you be saved? I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. After everything you've heard about John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that means he loves you, that he gave his only begotten son, his one and unique son, to come into this world for a purpose. that those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. Will you believe? You may be thinking, Pastor, how do I do it? I want to believe right now. How do I do it? Well, then talk to God in the quietness of your mind. Pray a prayer like this. Simply say, Lord God, I admit to you I'm a sinner. But on Christmas Day, this day, I believe that Jesus went to a cross to pay for my sin. And I'm placing my faith in him, my trust in him, my belief in him. And I confess him now as my Savior and my Lord. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you, God, for giving me life, adopting me into your family, and giving me eternal life. 
Lord God, thank you for Jesus. Now with everybody keeping your head bowed, if you prayed that prayer along with me, meaning it from your heart, that you wanted to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you simply indicate that to me by raising your hand and then putting it right back down? God sees those hands, put them down. This Christmas morning, Lord God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit working in the hearts and lives of the congregation in this church and those that are watching online. Thank you for those who indicate through a raising of a hand that they put their trust in Jesus Christ. Change their lives, Lord. Do a work in their hearts. And as a church, help us to assist in whatever way we can in the growth of these new believers in Christ Jesus. What a great morning it is to celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ. May we always recognize Christmas is about Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen.